It's a pleasure to introduce Dan Fox for uh, his uh, third lecture of his series. Uh, it's on symmetric trilinear forms and Einstein-like equations from uh, affine spheres to Greece algebras. Please. So um, what I wanted to start with was uh, was just to re quickly repeat a couple of things I said last time. Not not repeat what I said, but repeat the slides just to point out that so. When one gives a talk, one always tries to lie a slight bit to simplify things, and and sometimes the lies uh, are are sufficiently egregious that they require correction or or, or, or clarification the next week. So actually, what I wanted to comment here was when I had wrote down this, I had written down this general scheme of equations, and here I had written I had written here something like um, a of I, I had written I think this. And where this was the formal adjoint of this operator, these were two different generalized gradients. And this actually made sense in the case where this was the exterior differential and this was its adjoint. But in general, I actually have in mind, it, it really, one should write, to be more honest, one should write, there's some list of some, some number of generalized gradients in the sense that I explained last time that are, that are zero here. And it doesn't need to be the case that they necessarily come in pairs like this. Um, in fact, the, the point is that, in fact, in the specific case I'm, I'm considering, um, th this would be the, here's, this is the trace-free Kodazi operator. And last week I just wrote it, I just wrote this operator and I didn't write its trace-free part. The point is, it, in the presence of this divergence-free condition, uh, k of w equals zero and c of w equals zero the same thing and so i was sort of simplifying but writing it with c was bad in the sense that c c isn't one of these generalized gradients whereas k is because the generalized gradients go between associated bundles of irreducible uh, representations of the orthogonal group and those, those comprise trace free tensors and so to be more honest this k is the one that goes from here to here and, and and it's K not C that really is appearing. So for it to fit in the general scheme, um, it, it makes more sense to write it this way than with the C. And the other comment is I had written C star instead of divergence. And, and, and the truth is that C or K star is the divergence, but, but it's somehow going from a different space because it, it originates here and rather than here. And so it's, it's better to write it this way. And, and the divergence is actually the generalized gradient that ends here if you're, if you're dealing with trace-free tensors. And it's somehow, in that sense, it's not appearing as the adjoint of this K. So it's just to say that if you, if you don't take too seriously the details of the scheme as I, as I wrote them down last week, but they make sense in general, um, the the... Writing it in this way that I wrote last week uh, really is is it makes sense in the case of, of, of differential forms. And in general, I need to consider something more general. The other point is that that uh, that I wanted to make is that somehow the case of symmetric tensors, trace free symmetric tensors, which is diagrams like this that just have one row, and the case of forms, which are diagrams with only one column, are somehow the simplest in the sense that. These are the cases where the, the number of different sum ends here, when I take this, this, this decomposition of the tensor product with the standard representation and the irreducibles is minimal. And so the number of different generalized gradients I get out is, is quite small. In fact, in both of these two cases, there are just two that raise valence and there's one that decreases valence. In general, if I started with some something like this as my symmetries, I get more sum ends. The, the number of, of different sum ends here increases and the number of possible operators increases substantially. The, the other thing is that is that um, so that's that's just to maybe hopefully to clarify a little bit some of the things I said last week. And then the, the, the last thing is it, it, one wants to get out of this uh, these Weizenbach kind of formulas. I mean and 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 the key here is really that if, if I come back here, or I don't know, I need a, I need a, let me write a, I, well, I didn't succeed and that wasn't what I meant to do. Um, I was trying to get a new page, but I've never figured out how to do that. 
and new page after. Let's see if that worked. It did not. Uh, well, at any rate, um, I'll just write it here. In, in, in general, I have all these different generalized gradients. And, and so somehow I'm writing the covariant derivative as, as a bunch of different generalized gradients. And, um, and, and, and then I have this Laplacian. Th these, are, these are defined by projections on the onto distinct irreducible summands. So they're orthogonal projection operators. And so this, this winds up looking like this. And the point is, my equations are requiring that some of these vanish. Some, I don't know, A1 up to AR. And so when I stick that in here, some of these sum ends vanish, and I'm left with some others. I'm left with some sum of these Laplacians associated with different generalized gradients is equal to the sort of Bachner Laplacian here. And I, I want that remaining sum to be elliptic. Otherwise, this scheme isn't going to usually, at least in Riemannian setting, isn't going to work well. And I, don't, I, I seem to have added pages, but not blank ones. So in other words, I want, when I, when, when I impose the vanishing here, I want what's left over in, in this sum to somehow be an elliptic operator. And, and that's what makes this Weizenbach system go. So for example, in, in, in this case, in the case of, of, of this that I'm, I'm considering here, you get you get only three summands. This one is the divergence. This one is the thing I'm calling K, which is the conformal Kadazi operator. And this one would be the conformal killing operator. And so your Weizenbach formula, these two are going to vanish, the K and the divergence. So your Weizenbach formula should involve just L and its divergence. And, 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 and that's what's going on here. So this term will vanish if I impose my equations and I'm left with, with just this part. And, and I need something like that to happen in general for this scheme to work. So, so this is just, these comments are, they're not really relevant today for what I wanna to say today, but they're, they're meant to simply clarify a little bit the, 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 the scope of the general scheme I was outlining last time, which I, I think I was sufficiently uh, lacking in care in the way I explained it, that it, 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 it could have been more confusing than was necessary. Um, so, so, and here, of course, I should have corrected this, but I didn't, this is supposed to say. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's all I really wanted to say today. What I what I what I want to do is, is so really the equations I want to focus on today are are, are these here, um, which this hierarchy of equations, in, in particular, I'm most going to focus on the middle term, and and I want to and I want to go back to discussing this in the context of the geometry induced on on hypersurfaces in affine space. And, and so since I, I'm going to review a little bit what I was talking about last time, um, and not all of it, but, but, uh, but those of you who, who were not here last time should probably be able to follow, I hope. So let me, let me, let me uh, start again with, with this, this notion of an AH structure. So AH, this is abbreviating affine hypersurface. And it's a it's a it's a pair comprising a projective structure and conformal structure, and the definition is like that for a vial structure. For each representative connection in the projective structure, each representative uh, metric in the conformal structure, there's a one form that satisfies this condition. So if I didn't have the anti-symmetrization here in I and J, this would basically be the definition, one way of stating the definition of a vial structure. But I do have this anti-symmetrization. So this is more. This is a class of structures that includes classical vial structures. And um, I, I, I stated a lemma last time that says we can distinguish a particular representative connection from the projective structure by requiring this, this condition between the two possible ways of tracing the covariant derivative of the, of the metric. This, this left-hand trace is basically just the covariant derivative of the log of the determinant of H, if you like. Um, you have to interpret that because the determinant of H is a density, but it, it makes sense. And it, it just equals this up to some factor of time. And 
And, and, and there's, of course, this other way of tracing the, the covariant derivative of H and, and, you, and you impose some condition like this and it, it, it removes your freedom of, of varying the connection within its projective class. And I showed that last time I explained that in, in the case of the structures induced on a hypersurface in flat affine space, this condition actually picks out in some way the affine normal. Um, via the connection it induces on the hypersurface. And, and so uh, this, this terminology that follows is basically just exactly as it is for vial structures. Um, I guess in, in calling this one form of Faraday primitive, I'm, fo I'm following an old paper, Calder Banks. Uh, I think this terminology is relatively standard. My sign convention here, I'm not sure if it is or not. So I'm calling if I if I have a representative metric, I get a one form, which is just this with this normalization in front of one over two n, where n is the dimension of the manifold, and this is essentially, like I say, the, the logarithmic derivative of the determinant. And then you have this two form, which is up to a sign convention, the exterior derivative of this one form. And it, the point is, this doesn't depend on h, and it's actually the curvature of the conduction induced by Nava on the bundle of minus one over n densities. So in my terminology, a volume density is a one density. And so minus one over n density is something that transforms like minus one over n power of the, of the volume density. So I'll, I'll call my a structure closed if this, if this curvature is zero. And it's exact if, if I can, in fact, find representatives in the conformal class so that these associated Faraday one forms vanish. And in that case, this H is, is determined off the homotopy. I can multiply it by a constant without changing anything. But, and I'll call any such choice a distinguished metric. So the, the, the AH structures induced on hypersurfaces and flat affine space are exact in this sense. And talking about exact AH structures is essentially the same thing as talking about what are called statistical structures. So this is more familiar to some people. So, so a statistical structure is, is just a pair. Now, just a metric and, uh, and a connection that satisfy this condition. This condition is very similar to the condition that I used in the definition of the AA structure. There's just no Faraday primitive. And, and, and so you can see immediately that if H is a distinguished representative of an exact AH structure, well, it determines with the aligned representative of the AH structure a statistical structure. And well, that's you have to be a little bit careful because a statistical structure is usually said to be special, and I think there's other terminologies too. If if the if the associated volume density or two density here is, is parallel, and in, in general, uh, the problem is that when I have a statistical structure, I can think of it as generating an AH structure to say this this connection generates a projective structure, this H generates a conformal structure. And it follows from this condition that they satisfy this compatibility for, for any representatives. But it need not be the case that this connection satisfy this normalization here, which I call the line. That will be true in the, in the case that the, special, the statistical structure is special, but in general, it's not true. So that in that sense, statistical structures are slightly different than exact age structures. They, they, what, what's the correct statement is that special statistical structures, homophony class of special statistical structure is essentially the same thing as an exact age structure. And this lemma here is recording the, the, a more precise version of, it's saying if I'm given a statistical structure, I consider the age structure generates. This is what the aligned representative of, of the age structure looks like. It's, it's given by some perturbation of the, of the connection to find statistical structure. And observe, this isn't exactly the Faraday form. It's got a different constant form. So this is just all very elementary. So, so the, the precise relation between AH and statistical structures is given here, which is that AH structures are actually local, locally statistical structures. And I think this is, I mean, from a conceptual point of view, this is the right way to think about them. What, what do I mean by locally statistical? I mean, you can cover the manifold with charts so that you can pick out a representative of the, of the projective structure and a representative of the conformal structure that determine a, a statistical. So you have a pair consisting of projective structure and conformal structure. You can cover your manifold with charts 
so that locally you can pick representatives that determine a statistical structure. And it's a sort of straightforward lemma to see that this actually is, is the same thing as an AH structure. And um, in, in general, this representative won't be the aligned representative. It, you can always choose it to be the aligned representative exactly when the AH structure is closed. The point is simply here that, that uh, in fact, in this talk, I'm mostly going to talk about exact AH structures and all this fussing about closed and so forth is not really uh, that important. But the, the, the point is there's a simple relationship between the usual notion of statistical structure and these AH structures. And, and I think it's best summarized by this phrase here. And, um, and so that if one is finding this notion of AH structure seems a little bit weird, um, the best way to, the best thing to do is just think of special statistical structures and, and not worry about the general case. Basically, the added generality is essentially analogous to the added generality one gains in moving from a pseudo Riemannian metric to a vial structure. Um, it's, it's just that's it's so it's to say vial structures are to metrics as as AH structures are to statistical structures. And I think if you think about it that way, it, it's it, all, all that's changed is one has relaxed the compatibility condition that defines a vial structure. And let me I, here. I just wanted to make a comment. So, in general, I, for either statistical structure, for statistical structure, I refer to the its curvature means the curvature of the affine connection, not of the metric. And likewise, for an AH structure, the curvature means the curvature of its aligned representative, and not of some connection representing it. And and the flat cases of these structures have other names. Uh, Flat statistical structures get called by Cheng and Yao, they get called Taylor affine structures. A lot of people call them Hessian structures. Um, I prefer to use the word Hessian. So why? Because if, 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 the, if the connection is flat, then this condition here essentially means that at least locally, you can find a potential for the metric. You can write, you can write it in this form, at least locally. And so a lot of people will, will, will call that that uh, Hessian. I prefer to reserve the terminology Hessian for when the potential is globally defined. And, and that's a slight subset of, of the of the Kaler affine class. So the, I'm thinking of Kaler affine structures is, is really a synonym of locally Hessian. And one can check that locally Kaler affine is the same thing as, as, a, as an AH structure, which is projectively flat in the sense that this representative connection is projected with flat. And very special classes of these, such as the flat special Hessian structures, are, are often called uh, solutions of the Witten-Dijkstra, Verlin, Verlin equations, which are also called the associativity equations. There's a big literature about these, although there one usually admits singular solutions. And uh, it's a different world. And, and the basic references, the basic, uh, the basic references there are our papers with Dubrovin and collaborators, and, and there's a book by my name also. And there's a whole, that's a whole other world that I don't want to talk about it. And this notion of Majan parametric, I'll mention if I have time at the end of the talk, I'll come back to it. So just to give an idea of the general generality of this notion of A structures, here, here is basically a way to construct it from, from data that's more comprehensible. So in general, if I have an AH structure with a Faraday in a representative metric with the associated Faraday one form, then the definition means that this trilinear form is, is completely symmetric in all three indices and it's trace free. And, and uh, it, it follows that that if I raise indices using my metric and I, and I, and I take this this tensor like this, that this no longer depends on on the choice of, of metric. And so I tend to I like to call this the cubic torsion. It's essentially equivalent to this trilinear form. The trilinear form though rescales when I rescale h. So yeah, the, when I change h, this transforms, but so does gamma, and they compensate. So I. I if I have a representative, of course, I can look at its levi chavita connection. And, and so I can ask, you know, what if I'm given a levi chavita connection, a one form and a completely symmetric trace-free three tensor? 
Well, then I can combine them in this way right here to get a connection. It turns out that in this case, I get an AH, this, this connection generates a projective structure with which with the conformal structure generated by this metric that is an AH structure whose aligned representative is this connection and whose Faraday primitive with respect to this metric H is this gamma. It's to say, I can completely, I can reduce everything to sort of a metric plus the additional data of a, of a trilinear, trace-free trilinear form and a one form. And for exact AH structures, I can forget about the one form. And so the, the data of H and this trilinear form is exactly the sort of data I was talking about when I was talking about the coupled Einstein and coupled projectively flat equations. And so that's what's that's what's going to operate when I when I when I think about uh, Einstein-like equations for 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 these kinds of structures. There's a notion, there's an involutive notion of conjugacy of AH structures, and 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 basically it, it, it's the following: if if I, I take an AH structure and I take its cubic torsion, which is this tensor defined back here, this guy, and this of course has exactly the the the, the form of a difference tensor of two affine torsion-free affine connections. So it's symmetric in the lower indices, and it, it's otherwise it's so I can add it to the aligned representative of my AH structure. It turns out that that new connection generates with the given conformal structure, a new AH structure for which it's aligned and for which the cubic torsion is the, the negative of, of the cubic torsion of the original AH structure. So we call this conjugate. And this generalizes the notion of conjugacy that's well known for statistical structures. And it's involutive in the sense that if I do it twice, I get back where I started. And so it, it follows almost immediately that, that the self-conjugate AH structures are those for which this cubic torsion vanishes. And those are uh, modulo reinterpreting the definitions, just what are usually called vial structures. So AH structures really are a class of structures that generalize vial structures. And the vial structures appear simply as the, the self conjugate ones. So one anticipates that most notions that make sense for vial structures should have some sort of generalization in this context. And that's in fact the case almost. So th this slide pretty much summarizes what I did last time. It, it, it adds some detail. But the, the, the summary is that if I have a co-oriented, non-degenerate, immersed hypersurface in flat affine space, it acquires two conjugate exact AH structures. So, so let, me, let me just, for those who weren't here last time, let me re re review all the terminology here. And then I'll explain the top part of the slide at the end. So co-oriented means two-sided. I have an orientation of the normal bundle. Non-degenerate means the second fundamental form is non-degenerate. So the co-orientation and, and the non-degeneracy of the second fundamental form mean that I, I, I can regard the second fundamental form simply as a conformal structure on the, on the, on the hypersurface. The, the co-orientation is what allows me to, to choose a notion of positive in some sense. So that, so that when I rescale metrics, the, the different metrics in this conformal structure are the different representatives of the second fundamental form that one obtains by choosing different transversals to the hypersurface. And the affine normal is a particular transverse direction that's singled out by the requirement that the connection induced via this transversal be aligned with respect to the, the conformal structure determined by the second fundamental form. And, and so really there's a distinguished connection, not just a projective structure that's determined via the affine normal. And it's more aligned. And, and in fact, in the case that the ambient space is flat, one can check that, it, that this is an exact AH structure. On the other hand, when I have a flat affine space, I can consider the co-normal Gauss, Gauss map, which associates to a point in my hypersurface the, the annihilator of its tangent space. So, so the, 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 the dual of a, of a, of a flat affine space is a, is a vector space in a, in a canonical way. And, and, and here I'm sending, I'm sending P here to the annihilator of the tangent space at P. And the plus here means that I can do this in a way consistent with the co-orientations. 
so that I can actually just, I can view this as an array. And, and, and so here I get a projective sphere. This is just a projective sphere. And I can pull the flat projective structure on it back via the, the co-normal Gauss map to get, to get a, uh, a projective structure on M. And it turns out that this projective structure constitutes with the given conformal structure, the AH structure conjugate to the one that's, that's induced via the affine normal. That this is true is some, some computations one has to do, and I, I, haven't, I haven't shown them. They're, they're all relatively elementary things, but, but one has to do them. They're not, they're, not, they're not the kind of things I think most of us can do in our head. Um, so, so there is actually something to check here. These aren't, these aren't self-evident statements, I think. The reason this pullback makes sense is that the, the conormal Gauss map is an immersion if and only if the second fundamental form is non-degenerate. That's also a straightforward exercise that one has to do to make sense of all this. So the upshot is that is that you get you get um, this pair of, of, of conjugate AH structures, and, and this is actually what motivates calling them affine hypersurface structures in general. What's special about these is that one of them is projectively flat. So I, I like to say that the the one induced via the affine normal is conjugate projectively flat, but the point is one of them is is projectively flat, and this actually is is what characterizes locally those AH structures that are induced on affine hypersurfaces. Is that is that is that the conjugate one is, is projectively flat. And so if you want examples of AH structures that aren't locally equivalent to those induced on a on hypersurfaces in a flat affine space, you have to work with ones that aren't projectively flat or conjugate projectively flat. And those exist. We'll see, we'll see some later. The um, the, the other thing at the top of this slide is just to say that, in fact, all this works more generally. Um, I, I don't need to be working in flat affine space. I need to be work well, not all of it. The conormal Gauss map part doesn't, but the first part does. So I, if I have an ambient manifold with a, with a fixed affine connection, it doesn't have to be flat. Uh, to, for I can always make sense of the affine normal, as I explained last time. Uh, it, it's determined by exactly this by this condition in terms of alignment of the induced connection. So to say this story about the induced conformal structure, that really doesn't depend on anything involving the flatness of the ambient connection. And the affine normal definition that I gave in terms of you pick a transversal so that the induced connection is aligned with respect to this conformal structure continues to make sense. In, in full generality here. And the induced structure will actually be AH, which will, means it, it, it satisfies this, this compatibility condition here. Well, there I need some condition on the, on the curvature of the ambient uh, connection. And what I need precisely is that the, the trace-free part of the normal curvature where I'm taking traces with respect to this conformal structure I, so, vanishes. It, this is a little bit technical, but but the point is it works if this ambient connection is projectively flat. In particular, the first line here, this part of the story, makes perfectly good sense if instead of a flat connection here, I have something like the levy chivita connection of the Fubini study metric on a sphere or of the hyperbolic metric. So that uh, those are those are other contexts. In, in those cases, this it's not obvious how to make sense of the canonical Gauss map. And this side fails, and, and and but but the point is one gets further examples of such structures that way. So it's just to say that in fact this setup makes sense more generally, and so there's there's some reason for the extra formalism here beyond just speaking about statistical structures. On the other hand, when I'm in the context of flat affine space, I could just as well say that that um, I. My co-oriented non-degenerate hypersurface requires a pair of conjugate special statistical structures. The the induced AH structures are both exact, and so I can regard them as special statistical structures. And 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 one of these is projectively flat. And the conjugacy is essentially the same notion. It's 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 given in the same same way. I'm just using the the, the specific trilinear form associated with this. Right. It's basically the same definition. I'll denote the curvature of things associated with the conjugate connection by writing a bar over it also. 
So really this slide is just, it says the same thing as the previous slide. Only thing that's changed is the, is the language. And, and, and the, the other thing to observe is, is here. So really I, I think of this as I have a segment here. I have Nava here. I have its conjugate and halfway in between. I have the Levy Chavita connection of H. Okay. So that that's the way to the way to think. And this isn't the space of affine connection on the metaphor. And so in particular, the Levy Chavita connection is 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 related. Um, I hope I put the minus in the right place here. I think I did. No, it looks like I put the, the minus backwards. Because if, if this is a plus, this has to. Well, it doesn't matter. I, I mean, it, the minus, one of the sides has a minus on it, the other has a plus. Um, so let me, let me say, now let me go back to try to get back to the couple of Einstein and projectively flat equations. So this requires looking at curvature. So I have the curvature of, 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 of I'm going to think of, in this statistical language for the moment, just because it's simpler. Um, I have the curvatures of, of these connections. And, and the point is their difference is given by this C is the Kodazi operator. So, so C of L is precisely that. And so it's the Kodazi operator associated to, to D, to the metric. Okay. So a, a straight, and so, and then tracing that these are the Ricci traces means that the Ricci curvatures of these of these of these connections are, are related by the divergence of the of the trilinear form. So we say that the curvature is self conjugate if the curvature of, of novel and its conjugate are equal, the tensors are equal, and and we see that that's equivalent to to the to the trilinear form being Kodazi with respect to D. So maybe I should say with respect to the Levy Chavita connection. And likewise, the Ricci curvature self conjugate if the trilinear form is divergence free. Again, with respect to D. And the proof is, is a, a little computation. Basically, what you do is, is here you're taking the derivative of the, you're using the, the statistical condition. And, and you take the second derivative of the, of, the, of the metric and you skew it. So here, here, this is just the Ricci identity, I guess it's usually called for the, the connection. The expression of the curvature of the connection here, I'm, I'm lowering, raising, lowering indices using the metric. And, and, and this of course is just in this form and I rewrite that in terms of the levy chavita connection. So here, there's some terms vanishing that, that you have to work out. I mean, these are equal is actually computation, but that's just the, so I guess the Kodazi operator up here should have a two in it, the way I'm writing things on this slide, it looks like. I can never remember if I put a two in in my definition. I think earlier in the slides I didn't, but apparently here I was using it. So. And then on the other hand, you can directly compute how the, um, the, the conjugate curvature and the original curvature are related. So th this 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 is a, a, we have to focus on here are the indices. Here they're in the opposite order from here. Okay. And and so when you combine this stuff, you get out this this first relationship. And and when you trace it, the point is the curvature. There are two ways you can trace it. You can trace that are give sort of in, independent traces. You could trace on I and J, and that's how I define the, the Ricci trace, or you can trace in the middle indices, and it turns out that equals the Ricci trace of the conjugate curvature. Their, their traces, the scalar traces are always equal, but in general, the, the Ricci traces are not. And so, and so, and then down here, what I've written are, are so again, I have, I have Nava, Nava bar, and in between D. And well, my D looks like my novel, but that's a D. And here, Ream and Rich are the are the curvature tensors uh, of D and its Ricci trace. And, and they're expressed, this is basically the Kalkarni Numitsu product. 
So this is some, something like this. That's what this, that's what this product means. And, and, and so the, the, the difference of the curvature of Nava and the curvature of the levy Javita connection is given by this, this term, which is, and this term in the Ritchie case, and, and plus these Kodazi operators. And if we go back, way back here to the equations I'm looking at, and uh, we, we see these same terms here, okay? Up to up to the sine of epsilon and, and some normalization I have one fourths and here I've normalized them out. The terms that are appearing look just like these. Okay, it's just say this minus this and this minus this are exactly what appears in my coupled hierarchy. Okay, for it to really match, I would need that omega is one half of L. And then and then that would get rid of this quarter, this scaling here that you're that's present. And then the sine of epsilon is going to be plus one, I think, in this case. So so this this is now 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 I want to see what what is this notion of coupled projectively flat coupled Einstein entail for the statistical structures. So the point is, it's going to give me some notion of Einstein, but, but maybe it's not exactly the most naive notion of Einstein that I would think of. So if I if I think just of, if I start with a special statistical structure, I might I might I might want to call it Einstein, and I've called it naive Einstein. If if its Ricci curvatures are, are multiples of h, it has two Ricci curvatures now. Its Ricci curvature and that of its conjugate connection. And of course, for an ordinary metric. If, if this were a levy chivita connection, these would be the same. But in general, I have both of them. And, and I, I, I want everything in sight to be preserved by this notion of conjugacy. So if I'm going to imply require this to be a multiple of H, I better require this to be a multiple of H too. But it, it turns out that that um that it's not enough to imply that the scalar curvature is constant. So if you if this is a, a, a point that 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 I think is it from my point of view is important that so usually if one has the usual Einstein equations the constancy of the scalar curvature is a consequence of the trace differential Bianchi identities and if one runs the same computations in this generality of special statistical structures one doesn't get out that the scalar curvature is constant as a consequence of these assumptions one needs some further assumption on the curvature so one remedy is just impose the constancy of the scalar curvature uh, as part of the equation. So we just take this set of things as a as your Einstein notion, and this makes sense, and it gives rise to a a, a very general notion. And um, I think I think it's 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 a reasonable notion. It, it certainly has various nice properties. It's preserved by conjugacy. It recovers the usual Einstein equations in the case that this is actually. That this connection is actually the levy Javita connection of H, but um, it it's sort of unpleasant that the second condition isn't a consequence of the first. But what I'm calling the conservation condition isn't a consequence of the naive. What I'm calling naive Einstein. If if you assume that the so the vial curvature of what here here. So I'll, I, if I have time, I'll explain this more in detail later. But but. The curvature of, of the of of the of this nava, I, I can consider its vial curvature, the trace-free part of its curvature tensor, and I can consider the same thing for the conjugate special statistical structure. So let's say the vial curvature is self-conjugate if those are equal, and it turns out that, that condition plus naive Einstein is enough to imply this constancy of the scalar curvature. It's it's not necessary, but it's it's enough. And so, in fact, probably that that already is providing some evidence that this self conjugacy is something you want to add. And likewise, if if the trilinear form is Podazi, 
the constancy of this scalar curvature follows from the naive Einstein condition. So it seems that the, 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 that probably one wants to really work with this following notion. Or anyway, this this motivates thinking of naive Einstein plus self-conjugate curvature as the right notion of Einstein. And this is perhaps justified in the sense that this holds if and only if the metric and the associated trilinear form are coupled Einstein in the sense of my slides last time. It's to say they satisfy these equations here, okay. which are really a special case of the Einstein field equation maybe with the wrong sign here. Okay. The, the point being that if, if, if here, here I'm thinking of omega is one half of the trilinear form of the statistical structure, which is just the covariant root of H. And, and so that plus D are solving these equations, if and only if this special statistical structure is, naive Einstein and has self-conjugate curvature, has the, the, these conditions here, okay? And actually, the, 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 this point of view then, then turns out to be nice. I can ask, when is this pair uh, coupled projectively flat, these stronger conditions on the original slide? And it turns out that happens if and only if the curvature of the special statistical structure is a multiple of the metric, and in which case this multiple actually has to be constant also. And uh, the point is, if, if this condition is, is true, it follows from the, these computations here that the conjugate curvature satisfies the same condition, and that means these are equal, and then that implies via this identity here that L is quadrazi, and so and since L is trace-free, that's enough to imply that it's, it's also divergence-free, and so, so then you get out that... that when you when you stick everything in here, this part vanishes, and what the remaining equation says exactly that 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 um, H and and L are coupled projectively flat in the, in the sense of, of of my hierarchy. So so the, the point is that the the coupled hierarchy makes good sense. Uh, if you reinterpret it in the in terms of special statistical structures, in the sense that it it it, it amounts to uh, saying that the curvature the, the 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 strongest equation amounts to saying that the curvature of the special statistical structures are multiple of the metric, and the, and the middle equation of Einstein, well, the mid, of coupled Einstein is the same thing as as the special statistical structures is Einstein in, in this naive sense plus self conjugate curvature. Which is a is a normalization. It, 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 there are actually a lot of things that suggest that this really should be built in from the beginning. And in fact, okay, these equations I described up top make sense for AH structures that aren't necessarily exact. And so one has to work a little harder to make sense of them in that case. And and I maybe to save time, I'm not going to talk about that. But but. Um, They, it's the same as going from the usual Einstein equations to the Einstein vial equations. And the, the equations that one obtains for AH structures specialize the usual Einstein vial equations. And um, uh, yeah, so in this slide, I'm just commenting that in fact, there do exist uh, special statistical structures which are naive Einstein and don't have constant scalar curvature here. I wrote down one explicitly. It doesn't really matter what its explicit form is, but the point is that it's it's something on R3. It's nothing complicated. It has some very explicit form. Here, DX112 just means, uh, it, it just means basically DX, you, you, it, it means the symmetrization of dx1 denser dx1 denser dx2 and so forth. And so here, this is some polynomial thing. It's it's linear in the coefficients, and it's easy to check that it's it's that this is a trace-free, divergence-free quasi tensor, and and that you get out of this a naive special Einstein structure. But it's not Einstein; it's scalar curvature isn't constant. 
I mean, these are straight, I, uh, straightforward things to check. So it's just to say that there, this distinction is, 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 is real. Okay. So that's, that's all there. And then here's the, the relationship with um, affine geometry that, that provides, I think, further justification for regarding this as a right notion. So it, you, you have a, a non-degenerate coordinated hypersurface and flat affine space is said to be an affine sphere. If its affine normals meet in a point, which is called its center or a parallel, in which case we say its center is infinity. And I, I'll explain in just a minute what the basic examples are. But the the basic result here is that uh, for the for the non for the special statistical structures induced on such a on a, on a hypersurface in flat affine space, uh, they're Einstein with self conjugate curvature if and only if the hypersurface is an affine sphere. Um, and these conditions, if 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 if, if the hypersurface is dimension at least three. These are equivalent to, in fact, they're both, one of them is always flat, projectively flat, and it's, it's equivalent to the requirement that both are projectively flat. So actually, this yields solutions of the couple of projectively flat equations. And in fact, it gives a lot of them. And so let me explain that on the, that requires some comment about this notion of affine sphere. So this, this notion of affine sphere is the notion of ambilic hypersurface in an affine geometry. It's to say this, this statement is equivalent to the affine shape operator defined in terms of the affine normals and multiples of identity, which is the usual definition you use of umbilics in, in Euclidean hypersurface geometry. Of course, in Euclidean hypersurface geometry, hypersurfaces in Rn in Euclidean space, umbilics aren't very interesting. They're just pieces of spheres and, and, and hyperplane. But and one could fear that the same is true in affine geometry, but it, it's not, not the case. And let me skip a couple of these slides and go to this one. So he, here's a, a description of, of, of affine spheres in the convex setting. Um, so, so one set, as I said, that one, one calls it uh, a proper affine sphere if the, if the affine normals all meet in a point. And in the convex setting, one can distinguish the case for that point is inside the, the it, it is on the on the side to which the hypersurface curves, or in which case one says it's elliptic, or on the side away from which it curves, in which case one says it's hyperbolic. And so it's an old theorem of of, of various people, um, and full generality due to Calabi, that that elliptic affine sphere for which the induced affine, equiaffine metric, Blaschka metric, is complete, is is necessarily an ellipsoid. And in this case, the induced metric is just the Fubini study metric, and, and there's nothing interesting happens. The parabolic case is when all the affine normals are parallel. And again, in this case, in the convex setting, um, one has, due to the work also, I, I always leave out, but I shouldn't, the name of Voralov, which also belongs here, um, that uh, th these are just elliptic paraboloids. And with and the affine metric is flat. So again, nothing interesting is happening in these two cases. Um, although, but in the hyperbolic case, uh, one has, in fact, um, a theorem of Chang and Yao that uh, that says that if if you take any any convex domain whatsoever and you take the cone over it, okay, and it's a sharp cone, then you get a you get a foliation of the interior by affine spheres. Which are hyperbolic. Their, their center is down here at the vertex. So their affine normals all meet in this point, and they're and they're asymptotic. So that this foliation is like this. It, it looks just like the picture you get in the Minkowski light cone, and they foliate the interior. And it, it's due to Calabi that that in this case their, their metrics are, are have non-positive Ricci curvature. So th these the, these guys look somehow like hyperbolic space, but they're not hyperbolic. They're different. And this is extremely general. I mean, I can do this for any pointed cone. So, so this gives a very big class of uh, of, uh, of of affine spheres, uh, and, and consequently of Einstein, a couple of projectively flat uh, AH structures or special statistical structures. In the non-convex setting, uh, there aren't general existence theorems like this one, as far as I know. This this comes from solving some Majan pair equation. And so ellipticity plays a very fundamental role in all of the results in that ellipticity in the PDE sense, 
plays a very fundamental role in, in the convex setting. If I go to the non-convex setting, one knows how to construct lots of examples, um, but uh, one doesn't have systematic existence theorems as so far as I know. And it would be very interesting to, to, to say that. I, and I put, yeah, so I put on the next slide, I put some further comments. Um, maybe let me make this, this comment here first. Um, in the elliptic setting, actually, Hartog showed recently, this is five years ago, that if you have a convex domain like this, you can find a, 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 an elliptic affine sphere that, that, that goes to the boundary and is centered on what's called the central low point of the domain. It, it, the, the induced metric on this is no longer complete, but other than that, it's as general a theorem as the Chang Yao theorem. And, and so in some sense, the elliptic case is richer than it first appears also. Um, the other comment here is that, is that one gets compact examples, at least in the Riemannian setting, via this theorem. So the basic idea is, is it, it, this now fits into the world of parabolic geometry. So by a flat projective manifold, I mean a flat, I mean a flat parabolic geometry of a certain kind. One calls it, so I mean that it's, it's a, got an atlas of charts with transition functions, which are projective linear, general linear transformations of projective space. And it's properly convex if its universal cover is a, is a properly convex domain. It means there's an affine chart and, and projective space in which, in which, which contains the universal cover and, 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 and you can choose that chart so that it's a bounded convex domain. And in that case, I can consider the cone over it, and I get the I get the Chang Yao uh, affine hypersphere up here that's that's um, asymptotic to it, and it's and it's it's equiaffine metric, and all of this stuff behaves well with there's a uniqueness part to the Chang Yao theorem, and so the the deck transformations uh, preserve all of this structure, and I can actually just send it down to the properly convex flat projective manifold. To get a distinguished metric on that on that. So th this this point of view it goes back to the thesis of John Lofton, and 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 uh, so it, it means that on, on, so on, on such a manifold I have a flat projector structure, and and I get I get a uh, I get a distinguished metric which forms with it a special well. Uh, uh, in my language, uh, a, a couple of project a, a, a projectively flat conjugate projectively flat exact ions, uh, exact A structure. So it, it, you alternatively you can think of H. The aligned representative of this projective structure gives me a, a special statistical structure, which is which goes to uh, if I think in these terms. Uh, I get a solution of a couple of projectively flat equations. And so I have that on any properly convex flat projective manifold. These are quite general. They're more general than, say, hyperbolic flat hyperbolic manifolds. And, and so th this gives an abundance of compact solutions. W one should think of this special metric as something like the Taylor Einstein metric in the negative churn class case. Um, the, 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 the negative churn class is somehow related to this properly convex. Um, and one can actually, if one complexifies this picture by looking at the tube domain over this over this cone, one actually gets into the Kaler Einstein setting. But that's another story. And uh, so the the question that, that is really what has motivated everything I was trying to talk about is this one down here: Are there Einstein special statistical structures and? and other solutions to these coupled equations, which uh, which which are nice in the sense they have self conjugate curvature, but which are not locally equivalent affine spheres, and the answer is yes, and um, that's really what the intention of of most of the rest of the, the the talk is. Unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of time left for the most of the rest of the talk, so Omid will now tell me how long I have uh, remaining. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we can go as long well, as you want. But yeah, well, you know, because I, we st if I'll go if a few more minutes. Hour within but, like ten minutes, probably. Okay. But you can yeah. go over an hour. That's it's also well. I think I can communicate the key. The key. Okay, I think I can communicate the key points in just a few minutes. So let me try to do that. So 
the, the first is that I can find purely algebraic. So if I go back to my equations way back here, the beginning, okay? And if, if I consider that my metric H is flat, then this term vanishes, this term vanishes, and I'm left with some purely algebraic equation or here are some purely algebraic equation. You can't see, unfortunately, the H here, but you're left with some purely algebraic equation on this side in terms of the tensor and the metric. And so if I go ahead and assume even more that the tensor is parallel, well, then all this stuff becomes vacuous. I'm just left with a problem of pure algebra. And the point is that this pure algebra problem um, is actually quite rich and can be solved. So um, that's what's, what's summarized down here. If I assume that my background metric is flat and that and my trilinear form is parallel, I can interpret it as, as the trilinear form of a metrized commutative algebra that is exact killing metrized. So I'm going to explain what this means. But the point is it's some algebraic structure that's something like a commutative analog of a semi-simple Lie algebra. And there's something that's amenable to study, and I can actually study them and describe them in some detail. That's point one. Okay. So I will I will explain in a minute what all that means. But really, the, the takeaway is just um, with some extremely restrictive assumptions here, I can convert the, these equations into problems of pure algebra. And it turns out in, in this algebraic setting, I can completely describe, at least in Riemannian signature, the couple of projectively flat ones. And I have techniques that allow me to prove that, that uh, solutions that are there are solutions to the coupled Einstein equations that are not coupled projectively flat, because these the this turns into a question about associativity. Okay, that's that's observation one, and I'll come back to say a little bit more about this in detail in a moment, but I'll come back to that. The other is that um, okay, now I'm not requiring that my background metric be flat, but I'm going to require that it be what something very special. SUN, and I'm going to produce a compact example, which um, is, is in all, all other respects very nice, but is not equivalent to those induced on affine spheres. And it's, it's going to be Einstein, but not coupled projectively flat. So let me explain this example, and then those who wish to go do something else can go do something else, and those who wish to listen a little bit more can listen to a little bit more. So I, be, I think this example is a, is a, is a, is a, is a key one. So I, I'm, I'm going to consider uh, the special unitary group and at least three. So I'm regarding its Lie algebra skewer emission matrices. The, the, the metric I'm going to work with is the negative of the killing form, which is positive definite. And, and it can be expressed in terms of the usual trace of matrices uh, with, this, with this factor in front. And I'm going to define on it, that I'm going to define on the Lie algebra this commutative multiplication here. So you should think of this as what's in parentheses is, is basically the trace-free Jordan product, okay? So this, this is the Jordan product here, the symmetrized product of matrices, and I'm subtracting the trace because X and Y are supposed to be skew remission, they're trace-free, I need to get something trace-free out. The I in front is so that what I get out continues to be skew remission, and the T is just a parameter. I'm going to define a trilinear form, which is just this metric, the one that's determined by this metric and this product, and it, it has this explicit form. Okay. And this cubic form, I mean, P, P, what P is, is I think uh, this is, it should just be H of X of X, X, and it looks like I've put in. I may have put in a one sixth here. Um, so that's the relationship. So that's a polynomial. And it's it's easy to see that this this uh, this trilinear form is, is is invariant under the obvious action of the unitary group, special unitary group. And 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 because it is, so is its Laplacian. And 
so it's Laplacian is an, is an invariant linear form, a homogeneous invariant linear form on a simple Lie algebra has to be zero. So, so in fact, one concludes that this is a harmonic guy or equivalently this trilinear form is trace free with respect to the math metric. So I have the right kind of data here. And well, all of this just is to show that I, I can, uh, I can somehow compute the if, if I, I I'm gonna the connection I want to consider is this one. Okay, so this is the Levi Chavita connection of the of the metric determined by the negative of the killing form. And I'm I'm subtracting from it t times this trilinear form where I raise the index using the metric. And and so you can you can give that explicitly this way, and you can compute its curvature. And this curvature computation amounts to computing the associator of this non-associative product. That's that's what all this slide is trying to say. And, and let me just not get into the details. But what happens is the curvature comes out looking like this. Here you have a term that looks an awful lot like a modification of the of the usual curvature on a on a Riemannian symmetric space or something of, of this nature on a Lie on a Lie group. And and there's some perturbation here. And, and, and here's what the Ricci trace looks like. And you can see that the Ricci trace comes out to be a multiple of the metric. And here's the scalar curvature. And it follows from this explicit formula that this connection is not projectively flat for any T. And the reason really for considering T is that, well, it follows from this formula here that, that this and this are conjugates, okay? So this in fact is telling you that in other words, with one and minus one or one half, in general, T and minus T are conjugates. So in other words, th these generate special statistical structures and, and, the, and the ones for T and minus T are conjugate. And so none of these are guys, it follows from this formula, these guys aren't, none of them are projectively flat. And so there's no way that these things solve the couple projectively flat equations, but they do solve the couple of Einstein equations. So this is a this is a very special example. It turns out um, one can ask, well, maybe we can do this on any compact simple Lie algebra, and in fact, it's not true. So in fact, that this multiplication is somehow implicit in, in previous work or other people that we studied it for other reasons, and um, Lacker was looking at uh, bi-invariant affine connections on 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 compact simple Lie groups and more generally on minus symmetric spaces. And Naito was looking at um, Lagrangian submanifolds of, 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 of certain Kähler manifolds and, and the same issue comes up. And basically you have this result that, that a compact simple Lie group admits a unique bi-invariant torsion free affine connection except in type AN, which is what I'm dealing with above. In which case there's a unique one parameter family of these of these guys. And this is just something, basically this amounts to some, I'm getting out this this harmonic, this, this nice invariant polynomial here. And somehow you can't have something like this in other cases. <laughs> you have to look at the exponents of the Lie group and this, of the Lie algebra and this kind of thing. So it's a little bit, it's just a bit of representation here. The, the other comment here is that in fact, the SUN fits into a series of similar examples that exist on Riemannian symmetric spaces, and precisely there are these Riemannian symmetric spaces. So SUN is actually the C, the one that corresponds to the complex numbers. There are other examples that correspond to the reals, the quaternions, and the octonians, and all of these are somehow related to the isoparametric hypersurfaces I, I, I uh, mentioned in, in my previous talk. But what, what the other way to see this is if I go back here, this multiplication, as I said, was the, it's, it's the, it's the trace free Jordan product on, if, if I ignore this part, this is the trace free Jordan product on Hermitian matrices. And so from that point of view, that's what unifies these. Essentially the connection in all of these cases is I'm looking at the, Herm the trace free Hermitian matrices over uh, the different uh, real Hurwitz algebras, R, C, the quaternions, the octonions, where here N is three in the case of the octonions. And I'm looking at it with the trace-free Jordan product.
and I have to put in whatever the right number here is too. And, and that determines a connection in the same way as here at the, that with the, 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 the metric that comes from these is reminds metric spaces actually gives me further examples of, of these uh, that have exactly the same properties stated here. And for which one can prove that they're not coupled projectively flat and they're not projectively flat. And the, the, the proof is essentially the same in all the cases. One can compute the curvature and just see explicitly all of these things. So that's a very nice class of examples because in some sense, at least in Riemannian signature, it justifies that the formalism is worth all the, all the, all the Pain, pain, pain required to obtain it in the sense that there really are examples that don't that don't uh, come from hypersurfaces, and they're 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 as nice as you could possibly like. The the it follows from this formula that the curvature is self conjugate in the sense that as I said these connections are conjugate for values t and minus t, and, and you can see this expression doesn't depend it depends on the square of t. So it's the same for t and minus t. So these are as nice as possible, these examples, without being equivalent locally to the structures induced on affine hypersurfaces. They probably have analogous, uh, there are probably analogous examples in other signatures I haven't checked. Okay. But it, it would be natural to do so. And then let me just come back quickly well, uh, to to the, the the general algebraic context to see how one gets a whole lot of examples with a flat background. So the examples I just gave, the background wasn't flat. It was a, it was the levy, it was the killing form up the sign on a on a Lie group or or the metric induced by a killing form on a Riemannian symmetric space. But but so these examples in that sense are are, are somehow less nice in the sense they're not compact, but they're 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 general. And the point is that if I assume that I have a flat background metric and my trilinear form is parallel, then it's equivalent to the following algebraic data. So I'm looking at a at a commutative multiplication, which doesn't have to be unital, doesn't have to be associative, it's just commutative. And I have a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form, which is what I'm calling a metric, but now this is a constant thing. I'm just in the vector space world. And and I'm going to write L of X for the, the analog of what would be called add in the Lie algebra setting. So it's like the adjoint map. It's the left multiplication endomorphism. And the I'm going to call my, my algebra exact if the trace of these left multiplication endomorphisms are zero. The left multiplication endomorphism is just given by this symmetric trilinear form with the last index raised. So this exactness condition is equivalent to it being trace free. And it's going to turn out to be the same, if I come back here, if I take the levy chavita connection, my flat metric, and I take my trilinear form, I, I can build a, a connection here, which is no longer flat. And it, it is going to be a special statistical structure with self-conjugate curvature. And, and the point is, if this data solves a couple Einstein equations, then its Ricci curvature will be a multiple of, of of the metric, and this is a special case of things I already wrote down. So, so in this context, this special statistical structure is an exact Einstein, I mean, an exact AH structure, and the this exactness here is the same notion. And so, the, the algebra is metrized is exactly the statement that the trilinear form built from the metric and the multiplication is completely symmetric. <coughs> Just to say that the data here is is is, is the way I need it to be. So what are the coupled what are the coupled uh, Einstein equations, the coupled objectively flat equations, translate to in this algebraic setting? Well, the analog of the Ricci tensor is is a is well is, is this killing form essentially? Not quite really. The analog of the killing form would be this form here. The analog of the killing form. The analog of the Ricci tensor would be this form here. But because of my exactness assumption. And uh, this term is zero. So up to sign, the killing form is the same thing as this analog of the Ricci form. Where does this analog of the Ricci form come from? Well, I have the associator of my multiplication, 
which because it's commutative can be written in terms of the commutator of the left multiplication and the morphisms. So this equality here isn't true in general, but it's true for commutative algebras. And I want to think of this as something like curvature. And, and that's justified by computations down below, as I'll explain in just a second. And I want to call an algebra project, a commutative algebra projectively associative if this associator is, is basically, its trace pre part vanishes. That's what this says. Okay. That's the way to interpret this. And its trace part is essentially a Ricci form. And that's a Ricci tensor. And that's what I'm writing here. And if I moreover assume the exactness, this is up the sign, just this killing point. Now, if I start with my, my metric and my, my, my trilinear form determined by the multiplication, and I find this associated connection, its curvature actually is just given by up the sign and the constant normalizing factor by the associator. And its Ricci tensor is given by this killing form. So that's those are just computations. It's a change of perspective that's operating more than anything deep. And and and, and then one sees that the coupled projectively flat condition for these guys is the ex exactly equivalent to this algebra being projectively associated in the sense that this condition up above is satisfied. And the coupled Einstein equation is exactly equivalent to this, this guy being killing metrized with its killing form equal to a multiple of the given metric. So killing metrized means the killing form is invariant in the sense that this is this trilinear form associated with the killing form is, is invariant. This is the same notion of invariance that one has for the killing form on a Lie algebra. What happens is for commutative algebras, it's no longer automatic as it is in the case for Lie algebras, the invariance condition. And it has to be regarded as a, as a, as a structural condition. So the reason all this is interesting is I can characterize the couple of projectively flat solutions in this context. I'll state that on the next slide. And I can check whether something's projectively associated. And so I can write down a whole ton of solutions to these equations that aren't projectively associated. So let, let me just quickly say what those two results are and then I'll stop, okay? So the, the basic theorem is that if I have an algebraically closed field or the real numbers, an n-dimensional commutative algebra, which is killing metrized and projectively associative, it's isomorphic to some particular algebra. What this algebra is, is it's an n-dimensional algebra, which I like to call them simplicial. It's, it's, it's generated by uh, n plus one item potents that sum to zero and whose pairwise products satisfy this condition. And this appears very special and strange, but in fact, these algebras were, were considered a long time ago by, by uh, Rob, Rob Grice and, and uh, Kejarada in the context of, 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 of looking at models, of finding algebras on which finite groups act as automorphisms. And the, the, the special feature of these, of these algebras is that their automorphisms are the symmetric group on n plus one elements acting as permutations of these item potents. And so but the, the, the interesting, the point here is that there are non-trivial algebras which, which, which solve the equations of interest, the couple of projectively flat equations in every dimension, but, and, and they're unique up to isomorphism in Riemannian signature. This all should, well, this, this doesn't suppose Riemannian signature actually. This, is, this supposes this, or yeah, I mean, there's some, some assumption. And then the, 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 uh, the next observation is that there are many examples of, of, of couple of Einstein solutions, killing metrized things that are not projectively associated. And the most spectacular example is the, the Grice, what's called the Grice algebra of the monster finite simple group. So the monster finite simple group is the largest of the 26 sporadic finite simple groups. And it was constructed by, by Grice as the automorphisms of what in my terminology is a simple exact uh, commutative algebra um, of this many dimensions, which is a lot. Um, and and uh, it follows 
from calculations made by Tits and Conway that this algebra is killing metrons in the sense that I defined before. And um, it, there's actually a generalization of this. Frankel, Lepowski, and Moorman constructed a, a vertex operator algebra whose automorphism group is the monster finite simple group. And it's, it's, it's two graded piece. If you know what vertex operator algebras are, this makes sense. And if you don't, it, it, you won't make sense of them in three minutes. Um, is or even in three hours, um, or even in three days, really. Vertex operator algebra is just sort of complicated. Um, it's it's two graded piece is the Grice algebra in this sense. And so, for some certain class of vertex operator algebras satisfying some further technical conditions, one refers to their two graded pieces as Grice algebras. And and calculations due to Matsuo show that they also are exact killing metrized commutative algebras. And I, I can't tell you exactly what further examples are given here, but there, there is a finite list of further examples that one obtains this way. And, and actually, this essential construction somehow recovers the examples I, I gave before on, um, on the Hermitian, on the trace fee Hermitian matrices, too. In fact, they fit into the same setup. And, and I guess that's my last slide is that these exact killing metrized commutative algebras um, are quite abundant. So you have these ones, that, the grace Harada ones, that I like to call simplicial, that are, are actually projectively associated that say that they yield solutions with a couple of projectively flat equations. And then all these others don't, they're not projectively associated. But you have examples that come from simple Euclidean Jordan algebras. You have these Grice algebras from certain vertex operator algebras. You have tensor products of simple Lie algebras. So this is, this is uh, um, you can tensor any of the above examples with this one and you get another example, free is special in this regard. And then you have some other examples which don't fit as well. Um, you have some, some class of what are called Shang algebras by Vladimir Kachachev. And these arise in the, the description of, uh, of, of algebraic minimal hypersurfaces in spheres. And this is a finite list of examples. And, and then one or two other examples, which I've found. Um, and, and, and giving some order to the zoo would be very interesting. And I guess one could even, uh, yeah, I'll, I won't say anything more here. So th th there's, there's far more to say, but I've already gone well over the time I had allotted. And so I will resist the temptation to say it. Um, but, but, the maybe I should say what what I, what I think of as as the remaining. I, I think I put a slide in here somewhere with uh, remaining things that need to be developed in this context. Um, well, maybe I'll just say it rather than showing the slide. The the there should be general I existence theorems from a PDE point of view for the solvability of the of these couple of Einstein equations in particular. In other words, one would like conditions on the curvature of the original metric and some that, that imply solvability of these equations and solvability of this equation at the same time. And, and so the idea of studying a lot of these very algebraic examples is, is to set up uh, trying to study such an equation by perturbation methods. It's to say, take these examples with a flat background metric and a parallel tensor and try to perturb them in, into non-flat solutions uh, of, of these equations. And, and then one would like to be able to say, at least a Riemannian signature, uh, possibly what are all the solutions to these much more restrictive equations. Next point. It's very interesting to consider these things in other signatures in Riemannian. The reason for focusing on Riemannian signature is simply that it's easier. Um, things are elliptic, things are convex. One has a lot of machinery one can employ uh, that, 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 that breaks down. And, and uh, it, it, the same thing is true at the algebraic level and these algebraic solutions. Positive definite forms are easier to work with, with than indefinite signature forms. And, and so the, the, the problems there are technical rather than fundamental. And, and I, I think it's very interesting to explore all this stuff in, in Laurentian signature. Um, 
which would, if you think in the terms of affine sphere world, it's, it's corresponds to thinking about non-convex things instead of convex things. And, and so, so that's, that's, those are maybe for me the, 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 and then actually I, I mean, I, I've given some homogeneous examples, but, but I think that for instance, trying to classify at least at this level, homogeneous solutions is, 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 is viable at this level, of course, even classifying homogeneous Einstein metrics in the usual sense is a very hard and, and broad problem. So that as stated is probably too general, but 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 one can at least examine what are you know try to find interesting examples beyond those that, some of those that I've described. But anyway, I should stop talking because I think I've probably exhausted the audience more than once already. So I'll do If any of the audience is still there. Are there any questions for Dan? Uh, there's this piece about the Frobenius algebra, which you say is, is, is a gift by a particular subclass, right? Or, or... These, these down here, these, these guys. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, uh, are, are, are these things classifiable, right? I think, well, so, so I mean, if, if in, in the, it depends on what generality one is talking. So if one is talking about metrized and commutative, no, this is far, far too broad. The point is that the particular choice of metric matters a lot. It matters a lot that I'm actually demanding that it be this killing form and not some other, okay? That, but even that problem, so that's the classification of what I'm calling the killing metrized. There, I, I, okay, I, the, the projectively associative ones are classified. Here's the theorem. Uh, and I can actually, over the real numbers in dimensions less than four, I can tell you what all the solutions are. They're these guys. And when you get to five dimensions is where this example here of the, kicks in. And these are radically different than these examples down here. Um, these have an automorphism group, which is an elite group. These have automorphism groups, which are symmetric groups or finite. And uh, if, if you if you start looking at the list of examples, uh, I'll put stars next to the one where the automorphisms are are Lie groups. And, and here it's sometimes it depends on which examples I'm looking at. And then and then these ones here have automorphisms that are finite. And 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 one starts seeing that the probably the general classification, even for these algebras, is a hopeless problem. But with some further conditions, it may become. A reasonable thing, and and there's a kind of dichotomy that operates um, in the in the there's something that unites these examples, which is something called the the Norton inequality, um, which is a kind of positivity of curvature in some sense, and it distinguishes them from this example, which somehow has the as the has some sort of curvature or non-associativity that's negative. And so I, I think that, it, for instance, the simple exact guys here, so, so actually the Norton inequality isn't really true for the, with the exactness. I have to add a unit. It's, it's a little bit complicated, but basically this plus some condition like this might yield a class where some classification problem is tractable. Um, the, the the general problem is extremely is actually still too general is is it's it's i mean how to say it? even if you think of just ordinary einstein metrics right it, once you get to dimension five it's just too it's too big to say anything i mean, I mean to say anything you, one can still say some things but but one has to start refining one's question um if yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, so yeah, th th these are extraordinarily broad classes of objects, and, and, and from a certain point of view, that's a defect. I mean, but I, I think I think the the way to I look at it is 
one needs to sort of what are the interesting subsets within these big classes that really merit further study. And there are interesting examples like like this SUN example and, and, the, and the ones, these ones that, that one would like some subclass where these still appear. That, that's the kind of thing that, that that's that's what's of interest to me. But, Um, are there other questions for now? Uh, I have a question about this. Uh, 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 these non convex affine spheres. Is there, mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. um, is there a, any analog of Calabi conjecture that says, so not inside the cone, but outside of the cone is sort of again foliated by. Uh, so so uh, not indefinite. Uh, so the space light, not the uh, precisely uh, precisely what's lacking is the analog of the Calabi conjecture in this in the following sense. This theorem and all these theorems reduced to solving some Mangan pair equation. Okay, and in fact, I can show you the equation because I wrote some further slides where I wrote it down. Let me see if I find it here. It's it's this equation. You solve this on a on a domain on a convex domain. So precisely what Cheng and Yao, and then somehow from this U you construct your affine sphere. And it turns out that's equivalent to uh, to solving on on the if you go up to the cone level, it's equivalent to solving this Majampar equation here. Okay, which is this is the determinant of the Hessian of some function is a constant, essentially. Okay. And, and these formulations, without the convexity, continue to make sense. And so the boundary conditions maybe don't work, but this part does. And this part does. These continue to make sense in the non convex setting. So, say the, the, the construction of affine spheres from solving some Majan pair equations. Continues to make sense. Precisely what you're, what you, what you don't have, what I don't, what's not clear, are are the right sort of boundary asymptotic conditions to guarantee existence of uniqueness of solutions and how to how to set all that up. And then the other problem is that you you don't have. There's good technique for solving. These are fully nonlinear equations. You, 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 there's good technique for solving these things in the in the elliptic setting, but uh, the and I, there is technique for solving them in, in the non-elliptic setting, in the non-convex setting. But I, I I know nothing about it. It's definitely not as well developed. And so if you go back to the uh, the convex setting back here, I mean the point is this theorem of Chang and Yao. Kawali actually conjectured this theorem as such with the right hypotheses and the right conclusion. In the paper where he proves this, okay, he states the theorem as a conjecture, and and so one had very clear what one needed to prove. It was just it's technically very hard to do, and the reason that it's technically hard to do is the is the the solution of this Manjian pair equation that I'm 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 describing here, or showing you here, this one, is the estimates required, the a priori estimates required for this are are sort of a real version of those required for. And Yao's solution of the of the Kalabi conjectures in the in the negative turn class first turn class case, and, and it's just, they're essentially the same estimates. They go back to Kalabi in some form, but getting them and it, it's hard work. And 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 so when you go to the non elliptic non convex setting, you're 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 lacking a lot. Somehow is the answer. And 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 I'm not. I, I certainly am not uh, sufficiently knowledgeable about about uh, Manjian pair equations to tell you what needs to be done. So even setting. a conjecture hasn't been formulated by no 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 uh, because it's it's just yeah. I mean, what are the right conditions on the cone? You have cones, but they're not convex. What, uh, what, yeah, it's it's a question of getting right the asymptotic and the and the boundary condition. Well, you can um, have a convex cone, but just you know approach it from outside, so uh, it's sort of space-like. Um, that, that that's what I mean. 
yeah, you're you're thinking of the one sheeted hyperboloids. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's what yeah, I'm but yeah, you, you need to. I, I'm not. No, no. I I think I think one can do something for sure, but but uh, I don't. I have never understood how, how what I have never understood it. It's 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 maybe not. Um, I, I okay. So what I say here is is somehow relevant. Okay. Um, the, the, among these examples, so the examples, I, I, you can construct some very nice examples, which are given by these real forms of relative variance of irreducible free homogeneous vector space, irreducible in the sense of, uh, Sato Kimura. And, and, and what, what free homogeneous vector space basically means is you have a lead group with an open orbit, a single open orbit that, that fills out everything. And, and so th these are things like the determinant. Okay, of a symmetric matrix. Okay, and and it also you get the the one of the examples that occurs here is the Minkowski column. Okay, this one, the model for this. So you, my point is, these are your models. These are your models when you go to other signatures, and and there are a bunch of them. I, I mean, this gives you a list of 25, 26 examples. Families of examples, better said, and and so, you know, probably the place to start is in the Lorentzian signature case, which is probably the most interesting next case anyway. But 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 uh, and 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 the point of of looking at examples like this and and the, some, the Roland Hildebrand has some similar construction that is that, that, that these kinds of very nice symmetrical model solutions. Can, can serve as models for the PDE problem. 